the way. And then we'll close around 5.30. Now, let's, together, let's take off for nature from Africa to the Arctic. Welcome, welcome to day two of the 2021 East Atlantic Flyway Youth Forum. So I would, I'm very excited to uh, introduce you, you to Mia Ronca, who is part of the Conservation of Arctic Flora and Fauna Working Group of the Arctic Council. And we are thrilled to meet her. Mia is an ecologist, science editor, and journalist, writer, and poet. A mother, among other roles, Dr. Mia Ronca is the chair of the Conservation of Arctic Flora and Fauna Working Group, what we call CAF, of the Arctic Council. I'll now hand over to Dr. Ronca, so that she can share more about her work and um, her inspiring activities. Thank you very much. Um, and good afternoon from Finland. So um, as Elise kindly introduced, I'm Mia Ranka, the chair of the working group uh, of the conservation of Arctic flora and fauna under the Arctic Council. And uh, I'd like to thank you very much for the invitation. The engagement of youth is extremely important in, in CAF and, and so is the collaboration along and across the flyways. So I'm, I'm very happy to, to be here. Um, next, please. Uh, I have worked a lot on the science art interface. I have a background in ornithology, actually the seabirds in the, the Baltic Sea, uh, where of course most of the water birds are migratory because uh, the uh, Baltic Sea, uh, the sea ice during, during the winter, uh, in hard winters, the whole, whole, whole sea can get, get frozen. Um, I have been involved in CAF for eight years now, first in the uh, Circumpolar Seabird Expert Group uh, as, the, as the representative of Finland, and then as the uh, uh, group chair, and, and now as the CAF, CAF chair. And I have written quite a lot about birds uh, on the left hand in this smaller picture there's my poem collection that is called underground birds if translated directly and there's also a children's book uh, about birds and a group of children that that uh, are involved in in bird conservation uh, next please Uh, birds have been very important to, to people for thousands of years, um, providing different uh, ecosystem services. Ecosystem services are the benefits that people gain from nature. And there's uh, a categorization of these services uh, to provisioning services, different, different goods and, and products, regulating services that modify flows, processes, and, and frequencies of different phenomena, uh, cultural services, including, for instance, for instance, art and aesthetic values, also knowledge, science, educational values, and the supporting services that are kind of the basis of the production of all the other categories of ecosystem services. So they are the basis for, for the production of, of the other, other types of ecosystem services. Next, please. So birds provide uh, ecosystem services in all of these categories. So, so for instance, they provide provisioning services, different types of, of food and other raw materials. Um, they regulate processes in ecosystems, for instance, help other species to disperse, uh, regulate diseases, pests. They create habitats for other species, um, protect from predation. For instance, um, they can also uh, affect water quality. Uh, for instance, 
the uh, water birds in the Baltic Sea that feed on, on fish uh, can counteract uh, eutrophication in the Baltic Sea. So they affect the diversity of, of other species. And uh, they also provide different cultural services. Uh, for instance, uh, spiritual, uh, religious, aesthetic values, values related to recreation, also research, monitoring, education and teaching. And traditionally, many of these cultural services interlink with the uh, subsistence values of birds. So those species that have been important for subsistence, they, uh, they have all, also these, uh, for instance, artistic values and uh, religious values or spiritual values. And, and birds also participate in nutrient cycling. Uh, for instance, seabirds can bring uh, important amounts of nutrients from the sea to land habitats and thus um, create habitats for, for other species and, and uh, uh, also uh, fertilize plants, for instance. Um, some species of birds also, also pollinate, pollinate plants and, and in this way they support primary production. Next, please. So just as an example of cultural values of, of water birds, there's the Finnish national epic Kalevala. Uh, the text is in Finnish, but it des describes how the world was created from a golden eye egg. So the, the text is about how this egg got broken, and then the down part became the earth, the upper part became the sky, and different parts of the egg, uh, the uh, eggshell, and uh, and yolk became the sun, the moon, the stars, and and the clouds. Next, please. Um, water birds and, and birds in general have also been important for other peoples in the north. So, for instance, uh, in the Alta Fjord in, in Norway, the Sami painted uh, on the cliffs a very long time ago uh, geese, ducks, gulls, and cormorants. There are also these uh, rock paintings in, in Finland uh, featuring, for instance, um, swans. And in Siberia for the Kanti, uh, April was called the duck net month and the Yakuts called May for geese arrival month. So, so naming these months uh, according to birds or, or what, what is happening in, in bird life at that time uh, reflects the importance of, of these uh, water birds and, and migratory birds. Also in the Faroe Islands, the spring arrival of the national bird oyster catcher, Chaldur in Ferries, is celebrated yearly 12th of, of March. And there you can see on the photo, a, a sculpture of this species in, in Thorshavndi, the capital of the Faroe Islands. Next, please. So there are synergies and trade-offs to ecosystem services. Synergies meaning that the production of one ecosystem service can enhance the production of another one. And here's an example from the Stura Kalsö island, work by Martina Kadin. Uh, the island is in, in the Swedish uh, archipelago of the Baltic Sea. And a very central bird there is the common myrrh. And uh, in the figure, you can see how these different types of ecosystem services interact with, with each other. So the species has a huge flagship value for this island. People come to the island to, to look at the species and, and look how researchers are, are working on this species. Um, people coming to the island can also participate in research. And also many artists are attracted to come and, and work uh, on the island and, and on, on the species. And these different values interact with it, each other and enhance each other. So, so the more there is tourism, the more there is participatory research, the more people know about the species, which increases the flagship values and so on. 
but there can also be trade-offs so that the production of one ecosystem service uh, diminishes the production of the other one and for instance um, boobies and cormorants have been used for guano production uh, for for which reason um, many populations in the past crashed and, and then of course they were not able to produce as efficiently the other ecosystem services that that they are producing next please and uh, I, I feel that um, science and art are very similar as processes because they rise from the interest in, in an issue, the, the wish to communicate it, to analyze it. Uh, there's, there's a uh, process, kind of analytical process that ends in an outcome. And uh, I think art is a very good way to also convey the values of, of nature and uh, its important importance to, to people. And the photos are from, from a uh, symposium, Abo Agora symposium a couple of years ago, where a Norwegian performance artist, Kurt Johannesen and I, as, as a, uh, a seabird scientist produced this performance where we uh, reflected ecosystem services provided by birds. Next, please. Then just to end with uh, a couple of words about the CAF working group and our work with the Arctic youth. So as said, uh, CAF is the biodiversity working group of the Arctic Council. We have board members from the Arctic countries and indigenous organizations and also observers from non-Arctic countries and international um, organizations. And the observers are extremely important to us because we uh, work on, on these different flyways um, that I will show you in a minute. The mandate of CAF is to address the conservation of Arctic biodiversity and to communicate its findings to the governments and residents of the Arctic uh, to help to promote practices that ensure the sustainability of the Arctic's living resources. Uh, next, please. So, uh, as I said earlier, youth is, is uh, extremely important to us because uh, youth, youth are the, the uh, future of, of the Arctic and, and hold a critical stake in ensuring long term community resilience and uh, also the uh, conservation goals of, of CAF. Next, please. So here on the map, you can see in blue the member states and uh, next, please, then the observer states. And uh, next, please. Uh, as, as said, uh, many of the Arctic birds are migratory and uh, we have in CAF an initiative or project called AMBI, um, uh, Arctic Migratory Birds Initiative, that consists of work on four flyways. And uh, of course, many of the uh, environment, environmental pressures and uh, drivers that occur uh, along the flyways, they are visible in the Arctic and uh, and the uh, collaboration along the flyways and across the flyways is extremely important to us. Next, please. please. We're also very proud that we have an Arctic youth engagement strategy, which has been the first one in the Arctic Council, and uh, which identifies how to engage youth in the Arctic Council's uh, biodiversity conservation work. Uh, we are currently implementing this, this uh, strategy. Next one, please. There are five primary goals that describe how the youth are engaged in the work, work of CAF and how we can empower youth to advance the goals of CAF. So 
we have, for instance, these um, internships and uh, youth are included in the different projects that, that CAF has. Next, please. And during the Finnish CAF chairship, we have a separate priority for co-creation and communication of Arctic biodiversity conservation. And here I'd just like to draw your attention to the green text, um, where one of our aims is to support the engagement and empowerment of Arctic youth. And uh, in addition to the other youth work that we do in CAF, we have these particular outcomes for the Finnish CAF chairship uh, of producing a video with interviews of the Arctic youth. Uh, we have a writing competition planned. Uh, we are doing school visits, workshops for school kids and producing learning materials. Next, please. And here is, for instance, some photos from the CAF board meeting that was held in Finnish uh, Lapland, Sami homeland in Kilpisjärvi, Kilpesjavri, uh, just uh, um, a couple of weeks ago, and here's our uh, executive secretary, Tom Barry, talking with the school kids, and on the left-hand side, I'm giving a, a workshop, and we are planning to uh, continue the school visits during the Finnish CAF chairship, and, and to producing these discussions and, and workshops in, in the schools. Next, please. And uh, here you can find my, my contact information. And uh, as said, uh, I'm very happy for this invitation and, and for this opportunity. And I'm looking forward to further discussion and, and collaboration. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mika, Mia, sorry for this amazing uh, presentation and, and about the work that you do. Uh, I, I find it fascinating to see how you connect these different ecosystem services together and, and how they are important synergies between them. And I, I think it's beautiful the way that you can illustrate those synergies in particular through through art. It's, uh, it's fascinating to hear about your work. And also, I am very curious about the um, Arctic Youth Engagement Strategy. It sounds really like an incredible um, plan and with some very interesting and specific activities. So we look forward to hearing, uh, following the work of the Arctic Youth Engagement um, work and, and as well wish you all the best. Thank you very much for this fantastic presentation. If you, if anybody has questions for Mia, please do write them in the chat and we'll address them um, in, in the question and discussion session. Um, now, uh, I would like to move further along the flyway. We'll go further south where we will meet Nicola or Nikki uh, Hiscock from the Wildfowl and Wetland Trust. Nikki is lead avicultural, avicultural sorry, and project manager at the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust. She is going to tell us a little bit more about her work with Goodwith, Godwith in the East Atlantic Flyway. She is usually either in a bird breeding center or release area, and she pre-recorded this presentation for us. With major funding from EU Life to deliver Project Godwit. I'm going to give you a bit of a whistle-stop tour of what we've been able to achieve on the project so far. As the name suggests, the focus is black-tailed godwits, and it's those breeding in the UK, the Limosa, Limosa, Limosa subspecies, which we are concerned with. This shows the sites and number of breeding pairs currently found in the UK. UK breeders usually migrate to sites in West Africa, where they overwinter. Around 40 pairs are currently breeding in the fens. There are two key sites in the fens where black-tailed godwits breed. These are the two most important sites for godwits in the UK, the current stronghold. Both of the sites, the ooze washes and the neen washes, are flood storage areas. Three smaller wet grass and sites have been created adjacent to the ooze washes to provide areas which are not at risk of flooding. 
It is on one of these sites, Lady Fen, where the small remaining population at the ewes were breeding almost exclusively. In 2017, when the Project Godwit began, there were 35 pairs breeding at the Neen. The population was in decline. There were three pairs breeding at the ewes, only a critically small population. So, a bit of history to date with regards to these sites. The Neen, the orange represented by the orange line, was first colonised in 1984. The population grew rapidly, reaching a peak of 48 pairs in 2005, but began the slow decline from around 2006. The key driver of decline is low productivity caused by predation. The ooze, the blue represented by the blue and the green lines, a former stronghold with 65 pairs in 1972, there was a dramatic decline in breeding pairs as a result of increased spring and summer flooding, went down to three to five pairs by 2005. In response to this, the RSPB and WWT created flood-free sites adjacent to the washes. To achieve our goal to secure the future of breeding black-tailed godwits in the UK, we needed four outcomes. Increased population size, especially at the ooze washes. The population was now so small it was at high risk of disappearing altogether. Increased productivity, i.e. breeding success. Increase their range, spread the birds out around the ooze washes and get them breeding at different sites, especially the adjacent created sites. And come up with a long-term plan, a clear plan to buy with buy-in from all the relevant stakeholders. As a result, the project has six main objectives. I will explain a little more about each of them. Increase productivity, mainly by reducing predation. At the Neem washes, the RSPB have completed ditch widening, installed temporary fencing and gates annually, installed seven kilometres of permanent fencing and gates, and performed diversionary feeding of red kites. We wanted to enhance habitat and the WWT and RSPB have installed eel friendly pumps used to pump water onto sites as required to create ideal feeding areas for chicks, reprofiled over 60 kilometres of ditches and created new scrapes. We wanted to understand both local and migratory movements. RSPB have been fitting geolocators and pit tags to aid with this as well as colourings. This is a photo of a bird called Morgan being released after his geolocator had been removed. So far, 14 geolocators have been retrieved and therefore we have obtained information on those birds' migratory movements. We've received hundreds of colouring sightings from across the flyway, including sightings from 10 countries outside the UK. From these sightings, we have discovered that approximately half of the population used the Tagus estuary in Portugal, where an airport development is currently planned. So this is vital information which we can use. We wanted to trial head starting. Head starting means that eggs are taken from the wild, incubated, hatched and reared in captivity before being released back into the wild when they reach fledgling age. This ensures the birds are protected from predation and flooding during the very vulnerable early egg and chick stages. Eggs are collected under licence from Natural England and transported to WWT Wellney, where the eggs and chicks are looked after by WWT aviculturists. The birds are released around 30 days, either at the ooze or the neen washes. This is a very special bird called Erith. She was one of the first birds to be released in 2017 and returned to breed in her first year in 2018. She returned to the pilot project site to breed one of the created grassland sites adjacent to the ewes washes. She also successfully fledged a chick, now known as Daughter of Erith, or DOE for short. She has also returned to breed in subsequent years. To increase support and awareness, we have installed new in interpretation at two visitor sites on the ooze washes. We've been working with volunteers to engage visitors at those sites as well as at local festivals. Working with local community groups, giving talks and joining some of their events. 
We've been presenting results of the project to interested parties such as scientists and conservationists at international conferences and around the flyway. And we've been working with local school children, delivering sessions on Godwits and wetlands to over 500 school children. We also want to produce an action plan. We have just started this and plan to finish it over the next 12 months. So, what impact has our work had so far? We want to increase population size, especially at the ooze washes. The dotted line marks the start of the project. At the Neen, represented by the orange line, the population has remained fairly stable. 35 pairs recorded in 2017 and 35 pairs recorded again this year. At the Ouse, the blue line, the population has increased from three pairs in 2017 to 18 pairs this year. The pale lines show what was predicted to happen without action from the project. The population is now 40% bigger than it would have been without intervention. We also wanted to increase productivity. This graph shows the productivity of the whole Fens population since 2008, measured in fledglings per pair. The red line is the level needed to achieve the population to, for the population to remain stable, approximately 0.4 fledglings per pair. Anything above this line, the population will increase, anything below and the population will decline. Waders tend to have good years and bad years, and as long as there's enough good years, things tend to even out. It's the long-term average productivity that matters. There was very good productivity in 2018, as you can see, which initially gave us hope, but you can also see that productivity in the past three years has unfortunately been low, mainly due to high predation. But when you factor in head starting, the result has been dramatic. Overall productivity has been high, explaining the growth in population size. Head started birds seem to be surviving, breeding and migrating as we would expect. However, head starting is a short term solution. We only have one more year left. We therefore need a long term plan to promote and increase in, product in productivity by focusing on reducing predation and creating larger suitable sites for breeding godwits. So that's it from me. This project is a huge team effort involving many people with a huge range of expertise and this has been key to the success of this project. I would like to thank our funders and supporters and also thanks to you for listening. Excellent. Well, I hope you all enjoyed this presentation, this pre-recorded presentation from Nikki. Uh, very interesting to hear about such a successful project and also the challenges of that uh, this kind of project um, brings in terms of these specific species. Um, beautiful presentation and we really appreciate this contribution from, from Nikki. Next up, um, from breeding and the rearing of birds, we now go towards monitoring and counting them. Two Dutch ornithologists who link flyway sites at the Wadden Sea and the Bon d'Arguin, Mark Van Roemen and Albert de Jong, recorded this video for us in a gap between their field visits. Hello, everybody. Very nice that you are uh, attending this uh, talk about uh, monitoring along the East Atlantic Flyway. Uh, my name is uh, Mark van Rola. I work for SOF on the Center for Field Ornithology, uh, but I'm also coordinating the bird monitoring along the East Atlantic Flyway for the Water Sea Flyway Initiative. I will tell you something about uh, our uh, approach and results. And I've also taken uh, my colleague Albert, who attended us during this work uh, at the Bank d'Aguin. Albert. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, nice uh, to be here at the, the Youth Forum. And uh, as Mark already said, I uh, attended the, the total flyway count in 2020, and that was impressive. And I will share some of my experiences of that uh, count. Okay, uh, I will uh, give some, some insight in our uh, monitoring approach. So the title is Monitoring Kosher Water Birds and Wetlands Along the East Atlantic Flyway. I like to emphasize that it is not only from Solfon or the Water Sea Flyway Initiative, but we cooperate with Wetlands International and BirdLife International. 
Well, the whole approach, of course, is the East Atlantic Flyway going from the Arctic to Northwest Europe, all the way down along West Africa to Cape Town in South Africa. Birds breeding in the high Arctic. This is a red knot with chicks breeding on vast amounts of tundra, uh, large areas, lots of snow, cold. And after the breeding season, they come over to Europe and make use of our intertidal wetlands to gain new fat resources and, and, and do their molt. And some go all the way to, for instance, Mauritania. This is what they see if they arrive at the Bangdagen, the small village of Iwik. So a real Arctic wader using this, this whole flyway is going from the, all the north to the, all to the south in West Africa. But of course, when we are in Africa, when we do these bird counts, there are also other species, pelicans, flamingos. This whole flyway work is not only about the Arctic birds or the Northwest European birds, but it is about all the birds using these wetlands, these coastal wetlands. It's not only about the birds, but we want also to know what is affecting the birds. So we look to all sorts of human uses. We look to also pressures to the birds so that we have an integrated approach, counts of birds, and assessment of environmental circumstances. So here you see also an example from Africa, a lot of uh, livelihoods of course uh, going for, for small fish, but you have also industrial fisheries and also big uses like digging for oil and gas, which have of course high impacts on these wetlands. Here you see an example of how it looks like when we are doing these counts uh, and all over the flyway during January people are working on this. We have lastly estimated how many observers are doing this kind of work and during January 2020, our last total count, it were about 15,000 observers all over the flyway working for this monitoring. Here you see some examples, distributions of two species, both Northwestern Europe and in Africa, different flyway populations. Here some examples of the trends we detect for brand goose, common eider, common shell duck, but also African wintering birds, Eurasian spoonbill, great white pelican, greater flamingo. And you see it's a whole mixture of decreases, increases, stable developments. And this tells us a lot about the natural quality of these wetlands, about future management, uh, priorities for, for conservation, etc. Small story, this gives the average trend over groups of functional groups, uh, birds who are breeding in the Arctic, birds who are breeding in Northwest Europe, birds are, which are breeding in Africa. And a striking example is that the birds breeding in the high Arctic, these ones, are showing decrease. The average is below the zero. So on average, this group of Arctic breeders are, are really having trouble along the flyway, they are decreasing. The other time, the flamingos, the pelicans, some herons in Western Africa show quite reasonable, okay trends, stable or even increasing. So there's a huge differences in developments along this flyway. This is the kind of wetlands we counted uh, 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 along the flyway and especially the wetlands, the number of sites per country in which we did uh, environmental monitoring, in which we assessed the human uses. And one striking, one of the, the striking results of this assessment of, of, of pressures is that more and more effects of climate change are mentioned. So you see in red, uh, Europe, in blue, Africa, but at both regions, at all the sites, the effects of climate change, uh, temperature, flooding, uh, extreme weather is mentioned more and more as a threat to the wetlands and the birds and the people, of course. We have written down in 2017 a big report, it can be downloaded uh, from the Common Water Sea Secretariat uh, website and we are now at presently working at new reports. So the end of, uh, I think it was the end of 2019 that Mark asked me to join the team going to Mauritania, to the Bank d'Angue, to help with the total flyway count. And uh, when we get there in January 2020, uh, we first arrived in uh, uh, the capital, Nuak Chot, and then we had to do some arrangements uh, and uh, with the, the local organizations, of course, because they are also involved. 
And then after that, um, we drove with pickups to Iwik. That's a small village uh, along the coast at uh, the Bangdage. And there we uh, started the real job. And uh, we had a daily routine. So first of all, we started with uh, discussing uh, the dividing of the, the, the counting plot. So who was going to go where. And then after that, we had to discuss the transport, uh, whether we were going by boat or by pickup. And then uh, we had to go there um, and to be there in time before high tide, because high tide is the time to start your count. Because all the waders, all the water birds are gathering together at the, the shallow uh, areas. And that was an amazing experience because uh, the Bangdaga is an amazing place. When you come there out of the Sahara, you see the, the mud flats, you see the shallow sea, and you see so, so many birds, millions of birds. And so we did a count. It was quite uh, successful. We counted over uh, 1.7 million birds. So you can imagine how many birds there are there. It's su such an important place. Um, I think I learned two things of the whole experience over there. Uh, that birds are world travelers and uh, it was really nice to um, to be in a week and uh, at a moment I saw some ringed large girl so a lesser black backed girl and um, I read the ring I reported it to the ringer um, a friend of mine and it turned out to be that I've seen the same individual uh, four years before that in the Netherlands so that was of course, it was really, really nice. And then you see that everything is connected. Birds are world travelers and we really, really need to protect the whole flyway and all these very important areas. And the second thing I learned was that birds connect people. And uh, one of the, the things that happened that I was stuck in the mud and one of the local counters that helped, uh, helped me out because I wasn't able to do that anymore. Uh, and he was experienced in that area and that was really nice how we work together um, to navigate and to help each other out and also to count together and to help each other learning how to count such so many birds. Um, so um, that was uh, what I uh, wanted to tell you. And um, yeah, above all, I think it's really important that we continue this work and that we um, do this effort to, to be able to protect the birds because they need it. So thank you for joining this talk and we hope that you are encouraged to get involved in the Water and Sea Flyway initiative in your own country. And you can also follow us on Twitter uh, with these accounts. Great, what a great presentation of the, the work that um, both Mark and, and Albert are, are leading. Uh, I think that I saw a few comments in the in the chat box about how um, amazing it is that the, the counts that they're conducting um, and also these very personal stories, which is really lovely, lovely to hear. So we really appreciate this contribution from Mark and Albert uh, from the Dutch Center for Field Ornithology. Thank you very much. Now, we're a little bit behind schedule, but I'm very happy to um, hand over to Geoffroy Sitegetsti, um, who is the East Atlantic Flyway Manager at BirdLife International in Senegal. I am, I'll hand over to Geoffroy, who's here with us today, so he can share more about his work. Uh, yeah. Um... Thank you very much, Elise, for um, presenting me. Um, I'm going to share with you, I mean, the work that uh, I'm doing, and I mean, for the, on behalf of Bird Life International. I hope most of um, people have, uh, are familiar with the Bird Life International. But I, <clears throat> before, I, I, I don't know whether you can see my, 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 my presentation. Can you see my presentation? Uh, not yet. I think we need to hand over the access to you. Are you? Ah, there we go. Perfect. Yes. OK, Thanks. great. So um, thank you very much, uh, everybody. And thank you for um, um, inviting me to this uh, forum. Um, I think it's important for me because 
even I'm not a, a youth, but uh, I've been working with the youth uh, since um, I started, you know, um, this conservation work. Um, just to say that uh, when I started working for um, the Bird Life Partner in, in, in Central Africa in Burundi, I was the one to set up um, a wildlife club, and that was the beginning of working with the youth, which means that it's uh, something that I'm uh, proud of and also supporting. So um, uh, I'm going to present you the uh, work um, we are doing, and uh, some of them, like Mark Van Roman, have already mentioned the work we are doing together. So it's something which is complementing what he presented. So uh, as you know, yes, as Elise have already presented me, I'm um, Geoffroy Chitegetze, I'm um, the East Atlantic Flyer Initiative Coordinator, which is, you know, a very large partner, partner lead uh, initiative. And I'm based in Senegal. So um, just to uh, show that, uh, I mean, it will explain a little bit why I'm based in Senegal and also why Bell Life has his office in Senegal. It's because of, you know, the, the region is very rich. If you look at the important bird areas within the, 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 the area, we have um, 103 important bird areas. And uh, um, if you look at the coastal uh, IBA, we have uh, at least uh, 46 uh, IBAs and the, and the, and the among those 46 important bird areas, we have you know, 41 critical sites. And uh, we did in 2013 um, <clears throat> a, a, a scientific review to look at um, the importance of those areas and what are the bird, the migratory bird that are you know, um, wintering there or transit there. And uh, we find out that uh, some of the key sites that uh, um, uh, other colleagues that already mentioned are important. And we did a kind of ranking where we found out that uh, they are key um, sites like uh, Bandarga National Park, which is very, very important in terms of uh, um, weather, uh, migratory bird, and uh, Salum Delta in Senegal, we have the Bijagos, and the other site, yeah. But what you have to, 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 to know is that even there are th those are key sites, even the small sites are very important because they connect uh, other sites because this is a, a flyway. And uh, what you have to know also is like, for example, the Bandarga and the Bijagos, they hold, I mean, uh, in a, a big number of uh, uh, world population, for example, of the Bartel Godwit. 63% uh, uh, 63, uh, of the bartel gold wheat um, are, are transit on those sites. So they, that show the importance of those uh, sites. So the, 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 the project Coastal Migratory Bird, it was a project that came to support the conservation of those key uh, sites, those important bird areas. And, and that's why bird life uh, started a work in West Africa. Normally, we were most uh, south. Uh, you know, the only countries where bird life was present was in, the, in Sierra Leone, and, and for this region. So uh, you can see that uh, within that region, we um, started working with the partner, the local organization, uh, and those local organizations. They were not bird life partners, but uh, um, after the end of the project, we were able to. Uh, recruit to have those organizations joining us. So they are the, the, the bird life partners within uh, the country. And uh, one of the things was to support them, I mean, in, in terms of institutional capacity, you know, how to do the monitoring of bird, how to do the, you know, the, the policy and advocacy also element was very important to, to have those organizations to raise their profile and be able to advocate for the conservation of migratory bird. In, in, the, in, the, in the country. And uh, for those uh, uh, um, partners, they it build a kind of network within the country. And the one of the thing is to work on those important, um, important sites. And they, they work with the local community, what we call the site support group. So the site support group help you know, in conserving those sites. And another thing which is very, very in, in, in important is the wildlife clubs. You know, the partners within the country, they work with the wildlife clubs and the wildlife, they are mostly in schools and that's an opportunity for the organization to mobilize and engage the, the kids 
and the young people into a uh, uh, conservation of um, migratory birds. So the, the, the other thing was, uh, as I mentioned earlier, was to build that um, network and working with the government, working with the people. And this helped, uh, as Mark have mentioned, to work together for the monitoring of water birds. In January, so the partners, the NGO, the Bellac partners, work with the government institution, work with other organizations to do uh, the water bird monitoring. And also when it comes to training, is uh, when the training are organized, whether for um, monitoring of bird or site management, we do together, not only for the government uh, institution, but also for the, uh, the, uh, the NGOs and communities. Site action, the, the site action, there are, there are many site action where, you know, um, the partners, the communities are also doing. And the, one of the things that uh, um, Aronke have already mentioned is the, the, the ecosystem services. So the community are aware of those uh, ecosystem services and they are the one to, I mean, to work for the conservation so that they can be sustainable. That's the one. And the second one is, you know, uh, even improving the, 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 the livelihood of those communities. And also the, the, the young people, they are all, or the education aspect that I mentioned earlier is also another, it's very key. And those people, those young people, they are involved in celebrating, for example, the World Migratory Bird Day which is, a, they can celebrate at national level, but it's contribute to the bigger picture, to the uh, global uh, uh, event. Um, another thing is, uh, yes, which is related to research, uh, for example, where, I mean, we uh, engage with youth, uh, ex example, um, the people that are at university doing the research on different species, for example, the black tail godwit. Um, I mean, uh, we have people that we supported to work on the black tail godwit. Some have already their PhDs because of those, those support. And it's important that you, you've seen the work that uh, um, uh, WWT presented on the black tail godwit. And if you come in West Africa, also we air student people that work on black tail godwit. That connection is uh, uh, what we are looking for that will be helpful. But, so we, that is very, very important. And the other is that um, even when developing the um, national plan for species, so this, uh, the research, the element, the information coming from those people on the ground uh, uh, is helpful to, uh, to support the development of development and the implementation of those plans. And they, those people, those young people are uh, the one that will be implementing those uh, activities. Another thing is uh, um, looking at that, the bigger picture that I was uh, telling, for example, within BirdLife uh, International, we have already the partners along the flyway that are, are working together. And the working together, that means there's exchange between the organization, uh, the partners helping each other. Uh, if it comes to policy, it's come to advocacy, uh, the organization helping e e each other. And uh, we have uh, an element which is very dedicated to, uh, to the youth, uh, especially what we call the Spring Alive. This is a campaign that is organized every year. And that campaign is bringing the youth, the school together and um, organizing, you know, um, like celebration of event, uh, organizing contests, uh, within um, the countries along the, 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 the flyway. You can see, uh, for example, some of the example, I can give you an example, for example, here in, uh, I mean, in Ghana, where uh, the youth also celebrate the old migratory day. And here you can see in, in Guinea-Bissau, for example, where they organize competition, football competition, you know, and having the, <laughs> you can see uh, the birds on their chests, which is a, a way of, uh, you know, engaging the, 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 the youth. This is done uh, uh, through a string. <laughs> yeah, so um, the other thing is uh, that collaboration, which is key um, and uh, to bring more uh, uh, partners working together. Ellis, uh, um, I mean, uh, Ronke talked about CAF with the AMBI. It's uh, something that we work with and the other partners, uh, WWT, um, 
uh, working at the international convention, universities, organization. And this is, this is very important because it's a flyway. It's, it's uh, for all of us. Yeah, before I am to, to finish, I would like to um, first of all to uh, congratulate you for organizing this uh, um, uh, forum because it's important that's what we are looking uh, for to have the youth working together. This is very, very key. And uh, through this will help us to build the capacity uh, either for conservation, monitoring and other aspect. That is one. The second will help us also to do the research work, not to have something which is isolated, for example, in Arctic or in West Africa. So it will be something which is coordinated and helpful. And then um, I mean, it will help also um, to mobilize more uh, stakeholders. I mean, if you look at people that maybe are attending this youth, they are all only focusing on um, a scientific uh, aspect, you know, or, or looking at the birds only, but we need to look at, uh, uh, at the development, how the ecosystem services that Renke mentioned could also help the people to develop and also, uh, um, yeah. So um, I would like to end here and, uh, and thank you for your attention. If there is any question, people can send me an email, which is uh, down there. And uh, yeah, I'm open and available for everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. What a fascinating presentation. It's, it's wonderful to hear about your work and especially given your significant engagement in, in bird life, I think for nine years now, I think, and just to see your, the kind of activities that you're developing, I think there's, there'll be a lot of questions uh, for you also in the, in the chat and in the discussion. Um, I really appreciate also the, those final points that you made about what you're looking for uh, also in terms of collaboration. I think those are really important points for us to take from your from your dis, your your presentation and, and bring it into the discussion later on also to to explore those those specific opportunities. We really appreciate your time, uh, and we'll definitely hope you can stay on for for some questions because I'm seeing a lot of like uh, pop ups in the in the chat. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you very much, Jeffrey. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So now we're going to leave this flyway for another one that we know well. Uh, Vivian Fu is a communications officer at the East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership in the Republic of Korea. She helped us to run the equivalent of the Flyway Youth Forum last year for the East Asian Australasian Flyway. She's going to summarize that experience in that forum that took place last year, as well as the other great youth activities that they are currently coordinating in that flyway. The time zone means that she is uh, sharing a recorded presentation because right now it's very late for her, um, but we're really excited to share this presentation with you. Good morning, this is Vivian Fu, Communication Officer of the East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership Secretariat. First of all, thank you very much for the organizers to invite me to share about our youth activities in our flyway. Perhaps you have seen this uh, map many times, but please allow me to introduce the East Asian Australasian Flyway to you all. Our flyway stretches uh, from Russian Far East and Alaska in the USA all the way down to Australia and New Zealand. And these are some of the key species of our flyway. However, there are some uh, quite a few species that we have in common. For example, the Eurasian spoonbill, dunlin, barter godweed, um, red knots, and little tern. So there are something that we can learn from each other and maybe work together. Conserving migratory water birds cannot be successful without international collaboration. Therefore, in 2006, the East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership, or EAAFP, was established to promote dialogue, cooperation, and collaboration between a range of stakeholders at all levels to conserve migratory water birds and the habitats in the East Asian Australasian Flyway. 
there are five objectives uh, for EFP and our partners to work together to develop the flyway site network so that we can create a safe network of the important sites for the migratory water birds and make sure that they are sustainably managed. To promote values and knowledge of migratory water birds and their habitats via communication, education, and participation and awareness activities. To enhance research and monitoring activities to build up knowledge and encourage information exchange, capacity building for site managers, decision makers, and local stakeholders. And to develop the flyway wide approaches for effective conservation measures. The EAAFP is unique because it covered all the sectors from governments, NGOs, and private sectors. At the moment, we have 39 partners covering not, not 18 government partners, six intergovernmental organizations, 13 international NGOs, one international organization, and one private company. Apart from our official partners, we also have different collaborators, which forms and work on specific matters in our seven working groups and nine task forces. The EAAFP also sees youth as important stakeholders. In the past, we organized and support different events and to promote international interaction among the young people, such as um, conservation leaders program, um, crane school in Chiron between Russian and uh, Korean students on crane, online blackface moon build forum, world migratory birthday events. However, we want to do more and specifically to reach out to more young people who want to engage in conservation work. Therefore, last year, uh, we co-organized the Flyway Youth Forum with the Youth Engagement Wetlands, who are also the organizer of the East Atlantic Flyway Youth Forum you are attending now. And we also have support from other um, organizations such as Ramsa Secretariat, um, Han Shado Foundation, Ministry of Environment of Japan, ASEAN Center for Biodiversity, WWT, and more. Targeting future young um, conservation leaders last year in our Fly, uh, Flyway Youth Forum, we wanted to help them to build network to provide chances for young people to exchange ideas and build up capacity for them and to develop collaborative actions through this forum. We have recruited 87 young leaders. Um, most of them are from the EAA Flyway, but some uh, from the uh, outside our Flyway. Maybe some of you who are here now attend our Flyway Youth Forum last year. So they have different backgrounds, but all sit together to join the four days program. On the first day, we were kicked off uh, with the opening remarks by Dr. Jane Goodall and Ms. Martha Urego, Secretary um, General of Ramsar Convention, followed by eight inspiring presentation of our youth. On day two and three, um, there were intensive workshops covering five topics from youth advocacy in global policy agenda, field monitoring and research, environmental justice, communication and storytelling, as well as local community engagement. The last day was the Flyway World Cafe, in which youth um, participants can also interact with participants from other NGOs, government representatives, intergovernmental organizations. And then they develop uh, collective ideas for future actions. One of the main outputs uh, for the Flyway Youth Forum last year was the declaration of the Flyway Youth Forum, which was developed by the young participants. From the youth declaration, they are seeking for increased proactive and meaningful participation of youth in decision making process. They also seek for providing greater collaboration and establishment of youth-friendly platforms to work together with various stakeholders. 
they are also looking for support with greater resources investing in youth for youth led initiatives and activities to empower and raise awareness of all youth so we hear what you need and try to um, cooperate and hopefully um, this year we are launching this flyway think tank competition for the youth and this youth think tank competition was just launched two days ago and uh, we are um, welcoming you from the EAF flyway to team up with young people in other flyways and join this think tank competition. And lastly, I think all of you um, are now experiencing and will surely will enjoy this excitement of being connected with people like minded who are eager to share and contribute to conservation uh, to our flyways. And I really look forward to be part of this e event and hope that the EAAF can also team up with other flyways to work more with our youth. Thank you very much, and I hope you have a really successful and enjoyable event. Thank you. Excellent. Well, I have, it's great to hear from Vivian to, to see um, a recap of the amazing event that happened last year, the first Flyway Youth Forum. Just want to thank, thank Vivian for, for this pr fantastic presentation. It's great to see that the activities are go are still ongoing. No, that the the Flyway Youth Forum was not a one time event. That it has led to many more activities, including the Sting Tank competition, which we're really excited to see how uh, it will be developed. And now, now that we've heard from the five partner organizations, it's time to open up the floor to you, to the participants. And um, we will, I have gathered a few questions from the chat box. Uh, I know there's, there's a lot of interest and I think in fact uh, that mm, uh, a few, a few of you were particularly interested, for example, in the uh, opportunities with CAF um, to, to relate to what Mia is, is working on. And I think that Mia has already answered some of these questions in terms of uh, the internships and fellowships, but I, I just wanted to give the opportunity for Mia if you, if you want to add anything uh, about this particular uh, interest in, in CAF and how the youth perhaps in this space can interact more with your with your work and perhaps the youth in the that you're working with currently. Thank you very much and, and thank you for the, the kind comments in, in the chat and, and for the excellent questions. So as to the CAF interns, so they are open to all. Uh, they are there are internships and then there are uh, CAF IASC fellowships and uh, and also um, also uh, fellowships for for uh, early career scientists and uh, these depend on resources and uh, capacity to to host them and and also what funding uh, parties we can get and and what wishes or requirements they they may have um, at the moment there are no internships uh, available, but I, I hope we will uh, have them in, in future. And uh, I have put in the, the chat the link to the CAF IASC fellowship pages and, and also the link to the general CAF youth pages where you can find, for instance, our uh, youth engagement strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Mia, and thank you very much for those links. Those will, I'm sure, will be very interesting for for participants, um, and will I'm sure they'll be looking up the the youth engagement plan, and I definitely will too. I think it's fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, and we have a few questions also for Geoffroy, uh, Geoffroy sorry, um, or Jeffrey. I'm sorry, I'm using the French <laughs> version of your name. Um, it, we there's several opportunities to or questions around the opportunities that are related to to bird life in, in based in Senegal um, is in particular um, around the opportunities with spring life and if there are any activities in other countries 
We have mm -hmm. in a question from somebody in Senegal. I'll read it yes. in, in French. Yes, um, yes. Oh, you yeah. saw it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, yes. Go ahead. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Elise. Thank you for it. Uh, I, I think I've, uh, I also go through the, the chat and the, you know, um, get to the, some of the questions. So one of the things I would like to, <clears throat> to respond to uh, Hugo uh, from Todo Vala, uh, talking about binoculars with the, the youth. Um, I think this is, this is a, a very important question. It's something that we've been working since uh, 2012. And um, all the projects, when develop project, we always, you know, um, uh, acquire new binoculars to be able to support all those people that are doing, for example, the water boat monitoring. And within the bird life, we have a scheme uh, for uh, second head um, uh, binoculars. So the, 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 the partners, for example, in, in the VBN or RSPB, for example, they collected the old um, uh, binoculars, then try to refurb it or, I mean, uh, and we can use those binoculars to distribute to more uh, more people. So this is uh, the program that we already have. And then we, um, uh, the first thing we were doing was to give that equipment to uh, government institution, for example, but the problem because of, they keep changing and then sometimes the material disappear and it's become an issue. But uh, one of the things now we have um, started doing is to look at those people who are uh, passionate. Yes, we continue giving the equipment to government institution and also the, uh, our partners, but we also look at the individuals that are passionate, uh, you know, that uh, want to um, do the, uh, I mean, the bird watching, they provide those uh, equipment. Um, yeah, um, and the the second one is related to how people could integrate the, the Spring Alive campaign. I think this is, a, 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 as I said, we have the partners that are organizing themselves the, that uh, those events. So it's um, those who are interested is to link up with uh, the, the partners within countries, for example, if Senegal, Mauritania, Ghana, Sierra Leone, Gambia, uh, we have partner there when they organize and then they can join and they, and they, and they work with them to, for those campaigns. Um, the other thing is a question we, was asked by Gervais from DRC, um, whether we have activities in the DRC. Yeah, I, I think we don't have a life partner in DRC, but it's something that we are uh, uh, trying to, um, to look at because to get a partner is a process. It's going to take you know, longer, even 10 years. <laughs> But um, there is already um, uh, the government institution that uh, we work with, with um, uh, as Mark had mentioned, to do the water bed monitoring along the, the fly. Maybe uh, I could send a contact uh, to Gervais so that he can he knows who is coordinating the water bed monitoring in DRS. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeffrey, and uh, thanks for all these uh, opportunities and these links. I think uh, that'll be very, very interesting for for Gervais and for for other people in in the in the forum. That's uh, wonderful. I I also I love this uh, idea of the football campaign to the football game for the for the water birds. I think that's a really interesting way to to connect more young people to to these um, to these topics and these priorities. It's wonderful. <laughs> My colleague Connor, Connor has mentioned that Vivian is actually with us here. Are you here, Vivian? Oh, hello. <laughs> oh, wow. Hi, Vivian. It's so late for you. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Yeah, I'm excited to see this happening in the other flyway too. So I just stay up a little bit and see yeah, how it's go. And yeah, all the presentation are really inspiring. Thanks for all the great work and sharing. Excellent. Yeah, thank you so much for, for joining us. And uh, despite the late hour, um, there's actually a question in the chat for you, so, which I was going to send you by email instead. But since you're here, um, Pasco is interested in learning more about the about the think tank uh, awards, uh, and maybe if you could highlight a little bit more about what what is in the plans for that. Yeah, so um, I'm also just sending the the link here in the chat 
um, group uh, chat box as well. Um, so this think tank competition, um, we also hear that we um, the the youth want more uh, platforms and resources and networking. So um, yeah, it's actually the the idea developed with you <laughs> last year. So yeah, uh, we wanted to pay it forward, and it's also a trial for us um, for the year flyway and see how it will go. Um, the idea is like mainly to um, like promote innovation of the youth for pro, uh, conservation, um, uh, like focusing on three aspects, the science, the society and CPA, like communication, education, participation and awareness. So yeah, we are hopefully um, getting some proposal and some ideas from the youth. And this is the uh, first part. And the second part, we are also um, doing capacity building. So the part two of this think tank competition will be about a, work, uh, a training workshop for the youth, which will be um, lasting from this year. Uh, like we just launched it uh, two days ago and then it will run through um, October next year. Yeah, so I think that's it. And yeah, thanks for inviting and nice to see you all here. Thank you very much, Vivian. Wonderful that you're, you could be here also for the discussion. Um, actually, now that we, we have three of you, uh, Vivian, Mia, and, and Jeffrey, um, there was a really interesting question also from Hugo, um, looking particularly at all the work that you do that there might be Mm, let me read his question again. It was very uh, well formulated, um, but uh, let me see, sorry. So um, he mentions that a lot of the projects work with uh, marked birds that usually have a big need for public participation. As a manager of the Tour du Vala Spoonbills database, uh, he mentions that he can't avoid noticing that most of the people that send information are mostly older people or young people that are specifically doing research with birds. And so his questions to the, the three of you is, how do you think we can make this participation more attractive for young people or engage more or engage new people that are not necessarily familiar with the, with the bird scene, uh, I guess? Uh, it relates a bit to what uh, Jeffrey already uh, answered, but I wanted to open the floor and, and uh, yeah. ask you, the three of you, your your perspectives on that point. Do you want to go first, Jeffrey? I see you're ready to talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I mean, uh, thank you very much. Thank you for, for I, I think that is an interesting um, uh, question. And uh, I think um, uh, what we can do is uh, build to what is already there. Because I, I know that uh, within the countries, uh, for example, like here in the Senegal, there is already a team of people that are, they are still young, you know, they've been supported, for example, uh, by bird life and organizing kind, kind of, you know, um, bird watching. I think they can start um, through uh, uh, those. Uh, uh, I mean, through the support of those people that are already familiar with uh, um, birds, that is one. Second is um, where, for example, there is uh, some activities from those, the, the organization that are partner of this initiative. They could also um, explore how to support the people uh, on the ground so that they start um, getting interest. That's why I even mentioned that uh, this uh, um, initiative of, uh, you know, giving binoculars, for example, and a, a bird guide to uh, people that are uh, interested. It, it's it's, it's a, a important because even within the village, if someone see uh, that there are kids or, or I mean young people that are interested in bird watching, others will also be interested and then you can start um, using this kind of uh, um, way of engagement, yeah. Um, may, may, maybe to say that uh, I did this, uh, I was in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Guinea Bissau and um, I was invited to uh, give a talk in the, in the school, in the, second, in the secondary school. And one of the, there was an, a, I mean, a girl uh, that came to me asking, she doesn't have binoculars to, to watch the bird. And then I, I, I did, 
I give her, you know, my binocular, and then she was, uh, now she's able to go and do bird watching, which is interesting in her community. Thank you. Thanks, Jeffrey. That's really, uh, what, what a nice gesture also, no? Like also to uh, allow that. Um, it, it, it's just a special connection, no? And I really, I think that's really great. I don't know, Vivian, would you like to add something? Um, yeah, I, I think this is a really good um, question and we are trying to cater that as well. Um, like, um, I think there should be, there may be two aspects. Uh, first of all is the scientific um, aspect, which um, there may be, it may be good to have a, um, like centralized platform so that people know where to report all these recitings. Um, so, but that may be the scientific um, like um, field or the group has to come up with a, um, a consensus of like where these people or these uh, resources will go to. And then the second field would be um, how to mobilize um, bird watching uh, communities, young peoples who are interested in. Um, so here in the EA Flyway, um, I can also share the links later. We are also starting to try something and uh, different specific species like the blackface spoonbill also have a platform for reporting the reciting. And we also have spe a specific um, platform for like oriental stork and, and species like this. But in general, we like they are just scattered. Now most people are just sharing the their um, reciting as photos on a Facebook group. So we are using that platform, and, but there are like several different um, platform, but how shall we like gather them and like um, pass them through the, um, to the sci scientists. And most importantly, that the reporters can get a feedback of like what, like the information of their sighted birds. So this uh, communication is really important. And um, yeah, now like this year and last year, we tried a, a campaign called the hashtag um, like flag challenge um, campaign on the social media. Um, well, actually not so much successful. So uh, we are still trying different uh, different ways, um, but at least like uh, raising awareness through this um, social media campaign can be one way, especially for, for the youth. And I'm happy to like for you to also try out something and tell us like it, whether um, like these ways are working or not. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Vivian. Um, great to hear all the creative uh, ideas that you have to, to engage more different kind of people, more young people in, in these activities. Mia, I don't know if you wanna, if you would like to add something as well. Thank you. Yes, this is a very important question and, and uh, in all kinds of, of monitoring and conservation work, it's, it's essential how we get youth involved and I think in, in many countries, bird monitoring is one of the flagships actually of citizen science and, and voluntary work. And uh, many, many monitoring programs and, and in many countries, much of the monitoring relies on the work actually on uh, voluntary bird, bird watchers and, and the public. And I think uh, as to youth, so it's essential that there are activities and a bird watching community provided to the youth because um, it's uh, you need to to learn <laughs> a lot of things to 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 be able to monitor and and band and and also you need a community where you have people of your own age. So I, I think, for instance, bird life. Uh, international and, and for instance in, in Finland, BirdLife Finland is doing a great job in, in this and because it's, it's not, not, not only kind of, uh, it's, it's not only the uh, interest, it's the, it's the know-how and it's, it's the, the willingness to, to allocate time and uh, for instance in Finland, um, it, it has been a bit challenging to, to get young people involved in, in the past 
uh, years and the uh, community of bird watchers has become a bit bit older but uh, nowadays it's it's very uh, very positive to see that that more younger people are getting engaged at, at the moment and I think in terms of citizen science and uh, collect, collecting monitoring information it's also important that new ways are found for people to participate because there's also this phenomenon that people are not so willing to engage to very uh, hardcore long-term monitoring programs but they might be willing to participate um, for instance in kind of more low threshold light monitoring work. So, so for instance, in, in Finland, Birdlife Finland has uh, created these very nice public events that get actually huge participation and it's very easy and you don't have to have a lot of know-how. So it's, uh, it's the, this very low, low threshold, but when these are done uh, from, from year to another important data and, and information accumulate so so I, I think it's it's important that that there are different ways by which people can can participate and uh, well as, as Vivian said it's it's also important how things are communicated and how what what kind of outreach there is what what kind of feedback people get from their participation so it's it's also important that the, the uh, observations just don't vanish somewhere, but but people get get feedback and and get to see what is done with this data and that their input is is important. Thank you. Thank you, Mia. Really interesting, and it'll it's interesting to learn from your experience also, and and to see what BirdLife Finland, for example, is doing to to reach out to through this, these particular events the, where there's a big participation. I think we can, we've got a lot of like uh, uh, research and reading and, and more discussions to, to have to explore these questions. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a common question. And it's a question that extends also not only to monitoring water birds, but I think also just general knowledge and understanding of wetlands and, and water birds. So it'll, it's interesting to see how um, one of the uh, topics that we want to explore together is this connection of how, um, and also, well, this connection, but also to see how we can improve um, or in, engage more young people in these topics. Um, we are running a little bit over time, but I just wanted to uh, really thank again, uh, Jeffrey, Mia, and Vivian for, for, your, for being here uh, live, but also to thank Nikki, uh, Mark, and Albert for, for their fantastic presentations. I think it's inspired a lot of us. We've got lots of questions, lots of things to discuss. Um, and just to be uh, good on time, if you have any more questions, please do send them uh, over to uh, youthengageinwetlands at gmail.com or post them also in the Slack um, groups, in the Slack conversations. And we will uh, make sure to get those questions over to, to Jeffrey, Mia, Vivian, uh, Albert, Mark, and Nikki. And so we can, uh, even though the, the, this particular discussion is over, we can keep it going after, after this session. What were, so I just want to do a round of applause for our, our uh, presenters. Thank you very much for your um, presentations and for your time. We can use our virtual <laughs> clapping hands. <laughs> it was really inspiring and we really appreciate it. We'll now move on to a, a break. Uh, we'll take a, um, let me just double check how much time we can uh, afford. We'll take a, is it 15 minutes break? Yes, we'll take a 15 minutes break until 3.45 uh, CET. Um, so go and stretch your legs, do whatever you need to do, and then come back at that time. And we'll start with a virtual networking activity um, and, and then um, another uh, short workshop. Um, so thanks again, everybody. 
I hope you have a uh, you enjoyed this first part of today and we'll meet back in 15 minutes.